excuse the language, sorry. The logistical problem I had was that uh, Golden Haze, which is a Beneteau uh, 323 clipper, um, I purchased her about three months ago um, in Livington, Hampshire, UK, and um, I actually live in Boulogne, Siomere, where I am now, uh, and I have a marina berth for her here. Um, so I needed to get her back. I needed to get her back. And at the very beginning of March, around the 4th or 5th of March, uh, I was invited to do a couple of um, Doctor Who things um, for there's a new series of Blu-rays coming out about the old classic Doctor Who, some of which I directed. Uh, and two different producers uh, for the Blu-rays um, asked me to do shows for them um, out of uh, out of the south of uh, England, and I decided that this was the, this was really the perfect way to um, combine both pleasures: the pleasure of doing documentaries about Doctor Who and getting my new boat back to my home here in France. So I. Um, 5th of March, shot over to the UK, uh, did uh, with a carload, my car absolutely packed with binoculars, um, sleeping bags, cushions, duvets, um, life jackets, safety harness, all that sort of thing, all the stuff from my old boat, which was a um, Westerly Ocean 43, which I, I kept in uh, latterly in Barcelona before that in Gibraltar. Uh, and uh, I drove the car, loaded with the gear, down to Livington, did three days on one film, had a couple of days to unload the um, car into the boat, uh, make her sit a little bit lower in the water, and uh, then I went off and did another couple of days um, for, another, uh, for another show, and um, then decided to start sailing Golden Haze back to the UK even though it was pretty cold and wet and windy uh, but because the virus seemed to be we were all washing our hands we were, we were being told to um, uh, we were being told to wash our hands we were being told to be careful at that stage so i decided to um, sail out of Livington towards boulogne but to go along the coast because i had frankly i hadn't sailed golden haze I, I bought her sitting in the marina. I'd never, I didn't try her. I didn't have a test sail. I looked around her. She had, she had all the things that I felt I needed for a single hander, which is the way I'm going to be sailing for the foreseeable future. She'd got a in boom Jekyll's. Um, it's called a sail container reefing. It's a fully battened mainsail, and it rolls down into a container on a special boom and it can all be done from the cockpit and it looks like it's going to work really well. Um, I haven't had it going yet, I didn't use it um, on the return trip, partly because the reefing line seems to be badly stretched and uh, I, I, I'm not sure about it. I used the head saw coming back because in my experience I found that you can actually sail pretty close to the wind and a head saw is, you know, a head saw with um, Furling headsail is a really easy sail to cope with when you're by yourself. Absolutely um, easy to reef, easy to get in, easy to get down. It's not, you know, it shouldn't really, really, really shouldn't create problems. So I decided to use the headsail and the engine to get me back. Um, I would have liked to have done it in one hit, but frankly, in this cold, uh, it has been freezing, absolutely freezing. And standing out there behind the wheel, um, even with all my sweaters and t-shirts and oilies on, is not is not pleasant at all. So I've decided to do it in um, in stages. The first stage being really the shakedown cruise, if you like. The first time I've uh, gone out with that, other than a brief motor round um, round the uh, area just outside Livingston with one of the film crews. Uh, I've got no idea of how she works. I've had the engine serviced. I've had a new um, Rain Marine uh, navigator put in a uh, ES787 inch hybrid touch multifunction display. More of that later with AIS and, um, and radar. 
because I intend sailing to the Channel Islands this summer and I have been caught out there in thick fog and I think radar is, uh, after GPS, radar is the, uh, the thing I think is most important in a boat. So fine. Um, finished filming, got the big cover off her, uh, put that in the back of the car, left the car, left my Spanish car parked in Lymington, got into Golden Haze and at um, 8 o'clock in the morning took her round to the fuel dock in the Yacht Haven uh, where I fill up with fuel, um, surprisingly small amount of fuel. Um, I was really quite pleased about that. Um, paid my electricity bill and said thank you to the nice guys at the Yacht Haven for looking after Golden Hayes and uh, motored out into the area in front of the Yacht Haven, which is where the Isle of Wight ferries go up and down. Um, got the fenders in, uh, got the lines in, got them all stowed away saw a ferry coming out um, so I, as it was near low water, let him go first and then I motored out of the uh, Solent down the Mark Channel which um, for those of you who haven't been into Livington it's actually well worth uh, keeping in the channel. It's well marked with posts, occasional boy but mainly posts and um, you need to follow the channel all the way till you get to the starting platform uh, just outside. Having got to the starting platform um, I uh, got the Jenny unfurled and proceeded up the Solent towards Gosport, which was my intended uh, destination. Um, I had a nice westerly wind of about four, three to four, um, and I had because it was low water when I left. I had the tide with me all the way up, and so got up towards Cowes, uh, having having to pass between Cowes and Bramble Bank um, and then headed off to the fort um, which is the westernmost fort closest to Portsmouth Harbour entrance and I laid course for there uh, and again because I was on a flood tide did really really good passage time. bit lumpy but absolutely fine and with the wind from astern it was cold but um, bearable, cold but bearable. Got into a uh, 20 mile trip, um, got into the approach um, by the fort, just went um, slightly north of the fort and got myself into the small ship's channel because as you're entering Portsmouth Harbour um, there is a small ship's channel uh, on the port hand side coming in and you're meant to tuck in there and keep close um, and then you don't have to inform port control, or at least that's my understanding of the regulations. So that's what I did. Um, tucked in there and got off um, Premier Marina Gosport and spent um, yeah, 20 minutes, half an hour, bobbing around opposite our aircraft carrier, the uh, Queen Elizabeth II, which is uh, parked up on the other side, just, uh, just past HMS Victory. There is our major ship of the line, uh, our aircraft carrier. Uh, so I bounced around, taking care not to get too close because I've got a feeling that there's a lot of protection going on around her. Got my fenders out on both sides, got my six warps out, pulled up um, Premier Gosport. Slightly confusing for me because Channel 80 appears to be the main marina channel in the UK. Let me say I haven't sailed in UK waters for 20 or 30 years, other than collecting port port when I first bought her at Livington and uh, sailing her straight out of there across to Sherbourne and then down to La Rochelle, uh, which was her home berth for 10 years. I was slightly confused that all the marinas seemed to work on the same channel and there seemed to, it seemed to be, I found it sometimes a bit difficult to identify whether I was in fact talking to uh, Premier Gosport or um, other marinas. Uh, there was one that appeared to run a locking system. Anyway, not really a problem. Uh, got through to Premier, they allocated me a berth and told me where it was. Um, I'm delighted to say um, Golden Haze has got midship cleats, so okay, that's an extra two warps that have to go out if you're single handing. Uh, but it does mean that all I have to do is get the midship's cleat uh, line onto the pontoon and tie it onto a cleat 
and I've basically got the boat secured. Uh, I can then play around with the uh, headline and the stern line uh, to my heart's content. So, um, uh, got her into uh, got her into Gosport, parked her up, and went great. First day over, went along to the office where um, the there was a the, the the social contacting advice then was to keep at least two meters away from other people or people that you didn't know uh, and so I obeyed that in the office um, I kept my distance from the very nice people who checked me in and entered the boat and myself into their computer uh, got my key code and everything else and went back to Golden Hayes, plugged in the electricity and got the fan heater going uh, and got the uh, got some other wet weather gear off uh, and that was that was absolutely fine. Basically it had all gone well so the next morning having looked at Weather Online which is the brilliant weather service I used when I was coming up the Red Sea and across the Mediterranean um, looked on Weather Online and the weather for the next day to get me to Brighton seemed to be absolutely fine but then deteriorating. I had the choice. I either went the next morning or I waited for maybe a week to get um, a reasonable weather window. Uh, so I uh, obviously left the next morning, crack of dawn, untied, got a sailor out of the yeah. marina area, bobbed around opposite the uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, got my fenders in, warp stowed away, and proceeded down the inner ship, uh, the small ship's channel, um, on going out on the starboard side, going out uh, until I got to the um, first fort. Uh, and at the first fort, I then cut across the channel to the fort, which marks the end of the submarine barrier, uh, which goes all the way to land, which is on the other side of the. Uh, approach channel to Portsmouth Harbour. Um, it, it does catch the unwary this because you, you, it just seems to be sitting out there quite a long way out into the Solent from Portsmouth Harbour entrance but in fact it is linked by an underwater barrier all the way to the shore. There are a couple of points that uh, places where you can sail through the barrier. Um, I've never done it myself um, but uh, they're there but I chose to go up to the uh, up to the fort um, go around the uh, southern side of the fort and uh, lay a course for um, the Lou Channel uh, so I decided that from the fort to the Lou Channel um, I'm crossing a fairly wide Chichester Bay although it's shallow I mean uh, it was pretty bouncy I had um, 10, 15 knots, uh, which shouldn't really kick up much of a sea. But in fact, because the water is so shallow around there, uh, it's like uh, seven That's meters, eight sail. meters, 10 meters, that sort of size. Um, it was a bit rocky and rolly, and it was cold. It was cold. The wind was coming around a bit into the east, um, and it was. What? The other thing I'd failed to say was that the autopilot on Golden Haze wasn't working, nor the wind instruments. Um, the only thing I had working was the new uh, navigator chart plotter. The chart plotter was working fine, uh, although it doesn't display the sort of information I really, really want. And I'm, uh, yeah, and I was guessing at my um, course over the ground. In fact, at one stage, I got my telephone out, and that told me what my um, speed over the ground was. Interestingly, there was a Royal Navy frigate um, patrolling out um, outside uh, Portsmouth between uh, Nab Tower and um, the Isle of Wight. Uh, and I guess when I thought about it, yeah, if I had the flagship of my Navy in the harbour there, yes, I'd send a frigate out and have them patrolling up and down. Anyway, um, couldn't, obviously, you can't see the Lou Channel from a long way off. There was in fact a fishing boat which I made out on the horizon which I began to wonder if maybe the two boys had increased in size that marked the entrance of the channel uh, but in fact it had they hadn't they were still pretty small um, the pair of them but this uh, 
fishing boat was busy uh, laying pots or possibly a net there. So um, he was in the position as marked on my um, GPS track on the plotter. Uh, so I used him visually um, and I had to helm the whole way, 20 miles across the, uh, across the bay there. As I got to him, I was then able to see the, um, the two boys that marked the entrance to the loo. And it was now maybe um, two or three hours after low water. Uh, with the tide going in the right direction for me. So, uh, entered into the loo channel between the boys, uh, went across, um, keeping to the south of the big sandbank, which is what you, which is what you want to avoid. Um, and once I was past the big sandbank, uh, laid course for Brighton Marina, uh, which is another 20 miles on. Again, I, I'd forgotten how shallow the channel is, um, because I haven't sailed it for so long. Again, it was lumpy. I mean, with only sort of uh, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17 knots uh, coming now from the southeast, I, um, I did bounce around a lot and I was cold. I was really, really cold. So, arrived off um, Brighton Marina, having passed Brighton Pier um, and Shoreham, of course, had been on the horizon. The big tumors of Shoreham had been on the horizon for a while. Got outside uh, Brighton and proceeded to um, think about putting out fenders and warps and everything else and actually decided it was too lumpy. I'm not, I'm not as agile as I was and I really didn't with numb cold fingers uh, fancy scrambling around on the deck um, doing this work by myself. So I called up Brighton, uh, Brighton Premier Marina and got permission to enter uh, and they said I could go to a visitor's berth. So knowing that Brighton has a dredging problem, I know that it's got a shallow problem, um, I proceeded in there pretty carefully um, down the marked channel, um, staying in the middle of it, um, always with, I did, I did, to be fair, the echo sounder was working as well. Um, and uh, went down the channel and got into the sort of basin that's just in front of the visitors area and proceeded to try to heave to to some extent and start putting out my fenders and warps. Um, I would decide I was going to go port side too so all I needed to do was put out um, a headline, stern line, all important midships line and four fenders on the port side because the wind was now gusting 16, 17 knots, uh, which meant that when I came alongside um, the, uh, the north-south um, visitor's pontoon, uh, I was going to be blown straight onto it. I was going to be blown fairly hard onto it. And in a way, although it was obviously flat calm in there, um, it took me a while to get the fenders and warps on because I kept having to stop doing it, run back, take the helm of the boat, motor a bit further back to windward, um, and then start uh, heaving to heave her to, well, and stop her and uh, let her lay to the wind and rush back to doing warps and fenders. The marina very nicely sent, sent one of the marineros, one of the um, uh, dockyard, uh, one of the docking masters down onto the pontoon and I bought um, Golden Haze into where he was standing and he very nicely, very kindly took my warps um, and saved me having to do a lot of rushing around and uh, gave me an opportunity to get the fenders to the right height, which is always a problem um, when you're parking somewhere new. So uh, he helped me with that. We kept our social distancing and, um, and I tied her up and um, got her plugged in. They gave me my Wi-Fi code, my card, and I paid for three nights because the weather was clearly um, deteriorating. Um, it was going easterly, um, and I, I, I certainly it was going up to 20 knots, uh, 25 knots. So I'm not going out there in the freezing cold in that um, for no good reason. So I paid for three nights and um, went back to the boat, plugged in the electricity got the fan heater going, got me 
oil is off, got my wet weather gear off, got my sweaters off and uh, started to warm up. I was tired, frankly. Um, it, it was 40 miles, 42, 43 miles or something from um, Gosport um, to Brighton. Uh, fine, except I'd have to helm. The autopilot wasn't working. I had to helm every inch of the way. And um, on top of that, the cold really, really got to me. Fine. Next morning, um, I went to Aldi, which is the big supermarket in Brighton, and stocked up with um, tin food and uh, thankfully not no necessity to buy toilet rolls. I was I was shocked. The shelves were the shelves were empty. There was very very little to buy. I was able to buy milk, which was good. Um, I I was able to buy um, some tinned food. But really, not very much, uh, because I guess because of the big estates, which are just um, just to the uh, just to the north of the marina, uh, everyone had been down there. Everyone had been down there buying food stocks and stocking up. Um, so anyway, I got enough food for um, four or five days um, and took it back. Uh, took it back to the boat. I ended up with a situation where. My motor car was in Lymington, uh, and it's a Spanish car. Its insurance for being in England would run out in a few weeks' time. My uh, boat, Golden Haze, was not in her berth, which is Boulogne-sur-Mer in France. I wandered up to the um, boatyard area of Brighton Marina, up at the top, to a company called Eurotech, where um, I went in to inquire about getting my electronics fitted, I mean, repaired. I needed um, I needed the wind instruments. I needed the um, autopilot, most of all, um, and the speed log um, fixing. None of which were demonstrated. I didn't know what was wrong with them. I didn't know if they, if I'd broken them bashing around in the cylinder with the film glue on board, or whether it was electronics fault or what it was. And I I thought I might have broken them, but there we go. So I spoke to um, the nice lady there and said, look, I'm going to take, but I don't want to get stuck here because I want to keep making progress. And theoretically from Eastbourne, I can do a one hit 45 mile trip from Eastbourne to Boulogne. So if I take the boat round to Eastbourne, um, day after tomorrow, when the weather looks suitable, um, would, would it be possible for the people in Eastbourne to fix the boat? Malcolm called from the back office, we'll book you in for next Thursday uh, in Eastbourne. And I went, oh, thank you very much, sounds wonderful. So, went back to the boat, had one more day of warmth, and on the Wednesday, um, set sail out of Brighton, round to Eastbourne, um, a mere just 20 miles. Um, I left, I left, I don't know, I'd woken up at seven o'clock in the morning and it was daylight and uh, uh, I could have left it till later, but um, according to my chart, the channel into Eastbourne um, holds a depth of two meters, the dredge channel is two meters, um, at, and that's chart datum. So if any sort of anything that's not spring tides, um, there's going to be more water than that. Uh, and it's buoyed, and there's a sort of basin area, which I remember from sailing in there once about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. There's a sort of area where they used to keep the lifeboat um, sort of in front of the two locks, because you lock into Eastbourne, there's a locking system. So, probably a bad decision. I left, I left about 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, Bit of a bit of a challenge uh, because I was being blown on to the um, visitor's pontoon. Bit of a challenge getting up off the pontoon, but uh, did that all right, and then um, only had to put away um, the fenders and lines before I proceeded out through Brighton Channel, which was pretty shallow again, and I uh, made course for Beachy Head. Um, which is, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15, 10, 12, 15 miles or something from uh, Brighton. Uh, went round uh, Beachy Head, 
and then found my way into Eastbourne approaches. Hard to find, I actually found it very difficult to identify the entrances. Actually on the headland, when you come round Beachy Head, you pass a pier which is looks like it could be an entrance to a marina, but it's not. There are a couple of large boats, a couple of large mowboats tied up there. Got to um, looked further on and there was a sort of headland but no markings on it uh, so I headed for that um, yes I had a chunk plotter the trouble is the damn thing with the touchscreen doesn't work with gloves on the touchscreen doesn't work with cold fingers um, the hybrid it's a hybrid there's a control knob but the control knob is so insensitive you can't work it with gloves I mean just so anyway, I, I just went back to the old, um, you know, for goodness sake, I'm going down the coast. It's not, uh, it's not a mega challenge, and there's seven or eight meters of water under me. So I headed for this headland, and when I got to the headland, I discovered this headland does in fact mark the entrance to um, Sovereign Harbour Eastbourne dredged channel. There's a red marker buoy out there to the um, to the north of the marker buoy. Um, there is clearly shallow water and there's a load of little green boys marking it but um, um, on the uh, on the um, port uh, port hand side of the channel there's this largish boy and uh, I was able to go around that and gingerly feel my way up the um, up the channel at uh, zero knots well um, 2.5 of a knot or something. I mean, really, really slowly. Going up that channel, there's no more chart datum of two meters than fly. I mean, this was um, half tide. This was three hours after low water. And the depth sounder was showing um, probably only a meter or so under my keel. So that meant it was two and a half meters. It was, and if I veered, if I went anywhere not in the middle of the dredge channel the um, echo sounder was going down dramatically got to I tried calling them on channel 80 and that failed totally Eastbourne doesn't operate on channel 80 like all the ones did at uh, Gosport and all the ones and Brighton Marina did it seems to operate on channel 17 if I remember correctly it is marked up just outside the locks so uh, got to outside the locks called them up on channel 7 and they instructed me to come into the lock uh, and tie up but that uh, I was not to approach the office I was not to go ashore because they were operating total lockdown so in the three days between my arriving at Brighton Marina where run by Premier where they weren't operating a total lockdown to arriving in Eastbourne um, become Premier Marina's I'm sure quite rightly had gone into total lockdown um, and staff and customers uh, mar mar marineros like me uh, were not allowed to make close contact with the staff so anyway so I tied up to the floating pontoon and floated up to the top very nice guy came down uh, onto the pontoon and said okay we're going to put you into uh, a visitor's berth when you come out of the lock gates just hang a left and you can either go um, um, port side two or starboard side two, whichever you prefer. It's uh, you can park either side of that berth. And he showed me on a plan on the wall uh, where the uh, where the berth was. Lock gates opened, untied her, flashed up the engine again, drove out of the gate, hung a left, and made my way into the visitors' berth. Um, having tied up and made fast, I uh, came out of the. Uh, came out of the marina, walked across the two bridges through the the uh, two bridges that uh, go across the top of the lock gates to the marina office where I stood outside at the top of the stairs and through a window they handed me the welcome pack with my um, electricity card in it and the details of Wi-Fi and all the rest of it and I went back to the boat, plugged in um, and got warm and got warm again and had a meal Next morning Eurotech arrived, led by Malcolm, who knows more about boat electronics than anyone I have ever met in my life. 
absolutely brilliantly knowledgeable. He um, he went through all my gear, he got the autopilot working, he got the wind instruments working, he got the log working, um, he, his uh, young assistant who's a very, obviously a very talented um, young sailor went up the mast uh, to check out that the wind instruments was nothing wrong with my wind vane, nothing wrong with all that gear. All the problem were electronics in the pod which is um, in front of the steering wheel. Um, first rate, absolutely first rate, and they finished They finished up about 2 o'clock, 2.30, something like that, and headed back to Brighton. The weather was then appalling for four or five days, and I looked at my plan. It, it, the wind had gone round to the east and decided that to get to Boulogne directly from Eastbourne, which is, to be fair, only about 45 miles across the shipping lanes, was just not a girl with the wind hard on the nose. I could motor, but I bet I would only make about three knots. And in that cold, I really didn't fancy being out in the channel, uh, out in the channel, uh, in the dark, in the freezing cold, uh, not knowing what sort of reception I was going to get in Boulogne. So with the lockdown now proceeding at a pace, but people not restricted in traveling, uh, I decided that the, the best thing to do was to get my car back to France. So my darling nephew, Sim, uh, drove down in his car from London, picked me up and drove me to Lymington, where I picked up my car and from Lymington drove to Folkestone uh, for the Channel Tunnel, bought a Channel Tunnel ferry ticket at double the price advertised because uh, they increase the closer you get to booking with um, the Channel Tunnel, the higher the prices go. So they just raise and raise and raise the price, which seems a bit unfair, especially considering that only six or eight cars were on that Channel Tunnel um, train that I took. I got to French immigration in Folkestone, and the French immigration people um, accepted the fact that my home was in Boulogne. So they permitted me to go, and I drove onto the tunnel train got off in Calais and drove to my home here in Boulogne. Spent the next day here in Boulogne um, checking out how to get to Calais, which was impossible by any form of transport, public transport. I called a taxi um, and the guy was pleased with the job. He charged me 100 euros for it, but um, he was pleased to have the job and we practiced the French one meter distancing by I sat in the back seat first way from him and I just had my little bag with some clean knickers and things in it. Got to Calais, got on a P&O uh, ferry at Calais and they charge the normal price that they advertise all the time. P&O are a wonderful company, first rate. I was the only foot passenger and there were only six or seven uh, motor cars on that ferry, uh, but loads of lorries dozens and dozens and dozens of lorries. Um, chatted across the channel, having had a great fry up breakfast, got on a train at Dover for Eastbourne, and from Eastbourne got back to Golden Hayes and got on board, only to discover that there were three more days of gales forecast. And when the gales went through, according to Weather Online, it was still going to be easterlies. And I went, yep, I'm not going to do this. Um, I'm too old, I'm too tired, and it's too cold, and it's going to take too long. So I resolved to change my plan and go from uh, from Eastbourne to Dover. And from Dover, it would then only be a 20-mile hit across the channel to get to Boulogne. So um, I made a passage plan and put it into the plotter. I now had wind instruments, I now had an autopilot, I now had a speed log, um, and I had a windlass that worked in case anything went horribly wrong. Sat there for three days, and at the end of three days, um, the winds eased. They were still coming from the east, southeast, and I decided to leave at crack of dawn to make this 40 odd mile, 42 odd mile hit from Eastbourne round Dungeness, Dungeness 
where I'd been filming for the Doctor Who only a couple of weeks before, uh, and into and into Dover. It felt like a long way, and according to my title atlas, I would be pushing the tide almost all the way, which would slow me up. I reckon I was going to have up to a knot, knot and a half of tide against me for an awful lot of the journey. Uh, so I wanted to leave early, so I got some of the flood tide um, going up towards Dungeness, and then um, the ebb tide would be against me um, from Dungeness to Dover, but that's only 20 miles. And I felt if I kept in shore, I might be able to miss the worst of it. Got into the lock at 6.30, 7 o'clock. There was one fishing boat already in there. The three, he asked me what I drew, and I said 1 metre 50. And he went, well, be careful when you're coming out. And I went, oh, thank you very much. Um, I'll take note of that. He, the gates opened. He left in a roar of twin engines. Um, and I proceeded to untie, which took me a few minutes. Um, it was then had the slight problem of getting off again with the wind pushing me on uh, from the pontoon. And I just got out into the basin area in front of the two locks when um, my handheld VHF sprang into life and I heard the uh, fishing boat say to the marina, um, tell the old bloke in Golden Haze there's no water on the bar and he's not going to make it across at one metre fifty draught. And I went, ow, knickers. So I put my fenders back on and put Golden Haze into a stern and gingerly motored backwards back into the lock and tied up alongside into the lock. Um, the guys at Premier Marina said, well, you know, we can lock you out and you can tie up and then try again in a couple of hours. And they went, oh, do us a favour. Um, you know, I'm by myself and all this tying up and untying is really rich. Can I just sit in the lock? And they went, yes, of course, which was very generous of them. So to cut a long story short, I um, sat in the lock for a couple of hours. They did two or three lockings with the few other fishing boats that were going in and out. And at just after eight, um, they said, uh, we reckon you can leave on this next lock. You should get out if you stay in the mid-channel. So I thanked them and I gingerly motored out and kept in the middle of the channel and it was shallow. It really was shallow. I, I think there may have been only sort of like six inches under the keel at some point. Um, past the boy, um, keeping clear of the um, green boys to uh, port because there's a lot of shallow water that size. You can actually see it breaking. You can see the waves breaking on the sandbank there and got her out into the channel which was lumpy. This easterly wind had made it really lumpy out there. But I had the autopilot which worked for the first time, for the first time, thanks Malcolm, and um, stuck the autopilot on and gingerly started um, plodding around the deck, crawling around the deck, getting in my fenders and lines and warps and everything else, and setting sail for Dungeness, which was probably 20 odd miles from Eastbourne Harbour entrance. Got her going on the autopilot, what a relief. What a relief not to have to stand behind the wheel and helm every inch of the way. So I plodded, um, making quite good speed over the ground. I was surprised. I was carrying the tide. It had been worth it. I was carrying the tide. You know, we were doing six knots over the ground. And As I was approaching Dungeness, um, really congratulating myself for doing so well, uh, I got a call on Channel 16 on my uh, VHF um, handheld uh, saying, uh, Golden Hayes, uh, this is the military firing zone. So naturally I uh, responded and they said, well, um, are you aware that you are in a military firing zone and um, you need to clear the area immediately? So I went, Yes, uh, no, I wasn't aware, and I confess I wasn't aware. I hadn't looked at the chart. I mean, part of the trouble with electronic charts is I hadn't actually zoomed in from the course from Eastbourne to Dungeness, and what I'd not done was actually looked at it in close detail, and I certainly hadn't looked at it in close detail around the headland of Dungeness. I'd just 
set a waypoint that um, cleared the shallows and, and seemed reasonable. Uh, they said, um, please steer, I think it was 135 degrees uh, until you are parallel with the power station, at which point you can resume your course. To which I said, uh, yes, uh, yes I will, uh, thank you. So I turned, turned right 135 into um, an easterly wind. I mean, I went from trotting along with the current at um, five, six knots to two to three knots over the ground. Uh, had to pull the Jenny in uh, because it was just flapping. Um, going direct to windward like that, and I was just down on the motor, pushing me along, as I say, at three to four knots. Um, I spent the time looking at the navigator and checking that this pecked line almost certainly was the firing engine and so far fair enough i mean my mistake i've made an error so uh for about half an hour three quarters of an hour i plodded along until i saw that the plotter showed me being uh, clear of the firing zone and i was more or less um, a beam of the power station at which point i um put the plotter on to uh, Dover Harbour Western Entrance, uh, laid off a course and proceeded to head down that route, um, back up again at uh, five to six knots. Interestingly, the tide was still in my favour. The tide was still running in my favour, um, only by half a knot or so, but uh, I was surprised. It, it, I, I don't have a tidal atlas that examines that area totally, but um, Clearly, there are inshore eddies. So, had about 20 miles to go, I suppose. Um, four hours, three and a half hours, three hours maybe, uh, to Dover Western uh, entrance, where my pilot book told me that when I was two miles off the entrance, I needed to call up Dover Port Control and ask permission to enter the harbour. So I, I made a little. Uh, waypoint on the on the route I made a little dot on the route uh, ready to do that but three miles before Dover Port Control came up on uh, Channel 17 and said uh, Golden Hayes are we to assume that you're going to pay us a visit absolutely I mean charming very nicely and I went uh, Dover Port Control yes uh, um, absolutely I, if I may I would like to um, come into your marina and they said um, yes of course um, no problem when you're 200, 200 meters from the western entrance, give us another call and we'll clear and give you permission to, we'll give you clearance and permission to en enter the harbour if, uh, if all else is correct. I mean, great, thank you very much. I proceeded to spend the next um, three quarters of an hour getting the boat ready to come into Dover Harbour because I had never been in the marina, never been there in my life before, no idea what to expect. So uh, I called up um, Dover Port Control and they, um, they gave me permission to enter. So I uh, got in there, stopped, there was a fuel dock there, and so I fueled up um, at the dock. In the meantime, calling marina um, explained that I wanted to be there for um, two or three days uh, because there was more bad weather coming in uh, and they said and then I was going to leave for Boulogne and they said uh, yeah fine uh, so you can stay in the outer tidal harbour we'll put you on a pontoon there you're not to come to the office you're not to do everything call us on your telephone once you're parked up and we'll do um, we'll give you the codes and all the rest of it uh, by email and by telephone um, but we are uh, zero contact um, in this marina. That, that was absolutely fine. Uh, it was really easy for me to um, make my way up the pontoons in uh, Golden Haze and put her alongside and uh, park her up beside in the uh, pontoon, which I did. Uh, and I spent the next three days riding out gales there, gales from the east, blowing like stink. It was and bitterly cold. And so, past three days in Dover. The tidal streams run such that going out of Dover Harbour, um, the 
if I steer at right angles across the shipping lanes, which is what I'm required to do, in fact, the tidal stream is going to push me down to what's Boulogne the whole time. So it won't be 25 miles at all, it will be more like 21, 22, something like that. So that um, is uh, four hours, five hours, um, traveling. And if I get to Boulogne and they refuse me admission and they kick me out of the port or refuse to let me enter the port, then I can just turn around and go back to Dover and I can be back at Dover by sunset or an hour or so after darkness, whatever. Um, I would be bucking the tide then, but uh, that seemed fine. So I uh, awoke at uh, I awoke at dawn. As I came off my mooring, I called up um, Dover Port Control, um, and they gave me permission to uh, just exit the western entrance. They just said, "Go ahead, exit the western entrance," which was fine. I, I would at this point just like to say something about AIS. All these people, like the gunnery firing alert range at um, Dun Dungeness, Dover Port Control watching my progress, and then later on um, Dover Coast Guard talking to me, they were all able to identify me because I've got an AIS transmitter built into my plotter. And having a transmitter means that the name of my boat is transmitted, it's call sign, which nobody ever seems to use. Um, and my course and speed and all those sorts of details are there for anybody who's got an AIS receiver. So as well as its function of enabling me to not bump into ships or ships not to bump into me, um, it is also an identifier um, for various authorities and just on that basis alone we're worth having, I think. I laid off a course of one, three, five degrees, which if you look at a chart between um, Dover and Cap Grenet, that takes you straight across the shipping lanes at right angles, which is a requirement. If you're going to cross shipping lanes, you're required to cross them at right angles. So I kept that heading for the whole of the passage knowing, because I've looked at my tidal atlas, that the tidal stream was in fact going to push me southwest the whole time. I also knew that the, there is a very shallow area in the middle of um, the English Channel and it's marked by a light ship and buoys and is uh, the shipping lanes um, stay a long, long way from it. I knew I would be pushed over that but uh, chart datum there was three meters, 50, four meters, five meters, six meters. So, uh, and as the weather was pretty calm, there was a bit of chop, there was the normal channel chop um, and some cold wind. Uh, but other than that, um, there was no chance of my grounding uh, or going aground with Golden Haze. Uh, and I knew I'd be going over those banks. So off I set and within, um, within three quarters of an hour, I was entering the west going shipping lanes, which is all the ships coming down from the North Sea out of uh, probably Rotterdam um, and the German ports, coming down the North Sea and then they come down past Dover and they come down that side of the shipping lane. Um, and that was not too bad. It was pretty empty. I had the AIS um, images on the chart plotter going. I didn't bother with the radar because the visibility was excellent. I could see France, I could see the white coast of Dover behind me, uh, didn't see it. But I, what was important was that the AIS um, positions for all these ships were um, superimposed on my uh, magnetic chart, on the chart plotter, on the navigator. Um, and I was able to get across the British, English side shipping lane pretty easily with no no real problem whatsoever uh, and I was really doing I was really polite please with my help and I was well aware that I was being pushed um, I was being pushed westwards by the tide so uh, I was going to end up nowhere near Cap Grenade. As I got into the shallow area near the Vine Light Ship uh, near the shallow areas um, my um, handheld sprung to life and there was um, Dover Coast Guard calling me, asking me if I was aware that I was uh, getting into shallow waters, and I was able to come back to them and 
thank them very much and say, you know, yes, I was aware, and I didn't consider it to be a problem with my trial. They said, fine, okay, and they went away. But 20 minutes later, as I was entering French waters, Dover Coast Guard came back and told me the French Coast Guard, the Cap Brunet, wanted to speak to me on uh, VHF, I think it was 77, um, and would I go on to that frequency and speak with them. So that's what I did. And this was when I, I confess my little heart sank because uh, it was A, a bit of a problem because the, the um, eastbound shipping lane, the ships heading up the English Channel from the Atlantic towards Rotterdam and places was very, very busy indeed. And I was having major problems with my, um, with identifying which ship was which because my gloves, uh, the touch screen wouldn't work with my gloves on. When I took my gloves off, my fingers were too frozen to make the touch screen work. And the little knob on the hybrid knob was so difficult to operate. I couldn't accurately put it on things. So I was having a big problem um, identifying the names, which is what I needed to do in order to call them, of the various ships that I had to weave between, either go over across their bows or go across their stern. I mean, mainly across their stern, of course. So anyway, Captain A Coast Guard um, spoke to me, and they asked me my intention, and I said, I'm going into Boulogne port. Uh, my intention is to go to Boulogne. Um, my home is in uh, Boulogne, and the uh, Port de Tache, the um, marina place for the boat, is in um, Bassin Napoleon in um, Boulogne. Marina. And they then asked me for my address, they asked me for my passport number, um, they asked me when I had moved into my home in Boulogne, which was last September. Um, they asked me, they interrogated me um, for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I had to drop the microphone a couple of times and whip up on deck and check I wasn't going to. Um, have a problem with uh, the, the, the ships in the lane because uh, I'm crossing the lane so I've got to keep out of their way and uh, also they were coming up on my starboard side which means doubly I have to keep out of their way. So then at the end of the interview, it wasn't an interrogation, it was a very a very pleasant, very charming interview, uh, they said okay we will uh, very well, we'll, uh, we'll come back to you, stand by. Uh, so I said stand by on this frequency or on 16, they said stand by on 16. So if I, fine, thank you very much, put the microphone down, went back on deck into the cockpit and uh, proceeded to um, talk to, on the VHF, to various ships uh, to agree that um, I would go around their stern or they were going to accelerate slightly so to make it easier for me. They were, they were very helpful, very friendly. AIS, I reckon, is um, absolutely brilliant. So, um, I then spent the next hour and a half feeling concerned about the situation, naturally. Um, looking behind me, uh, the White Cliffs of Dover were getting um, very, very small on the horizon, and the coast of France was getting very, very big on the horizon, and every minute that went by probably represented two minutes if I had to get back to Dover, because I would be going across, having to go into the stream. Uh, into the tidal stream, which had been favouring me on my passage to Boulogne. Hour and a half later, um, Cap Grenet came back on the, I heard it on the handheld, put the handheld down, went down below, picked up the proper VHF microphone, and said, uh, yep, this is a uh, golden haze, I copy, go ahead please, sir. Uh, and they said, uh, right, um, permission is granted for you to enter Boulogne my little heart went, oh, thank goodness, thank goodness. Um, you will proceed to um, the ship's berth. Uh, what is the berth number, please? Uh, and I gave them the berth number. An immigration official um, will come into the um, marina, will come to the pontoon, and will instruct you on how you ought to behave in relation to coronavirus here in France and you will return from the boat to your apartment where you will be in lockdown for 15 days. And I went, wonderful, thank you very much, I'm, I'm most grateful. 
Um, and I said, well, wh what happens when I get to um, Boulogne Port? Will they, will they know I'm coming? They said, yes, we will contact Boulogne and we will, uh, they are aware of your arrival. They'll be aware of your arrival and you'll be allowed to, um, you'll be allowed to enter the port. All French ports are in fact closed to foreign flag vessels, but because it's your home and because it's the, port, the boat's port de tache, you will be allowed in. Perfect. That's his room. So I went back, I went back on deck and um, literally within half an hour, within half an hour, there was the big breakwater of the outer port of uh, Boulogne. I called up um, Boulogne Port Control and said, this is Golden Hayes and I'm um, entering your harbour. And they went, yes, um, Golden Hayes, we're aware of your arrival, uh, come on in. And, and motored into the uh, Bassin Napoleon for the first time in my life and proceeded to jump ashore and tie the boat up and adjust the fenders. Whilst I was doing that, a very smartly dressed and um, charming immigration official, uniformed immigration official, um, arrived on the pontoon um, with a piece of paper in his hand and said, um, uh, Bienvenue, uh, welcome. He told me about the lockdown procedures, so I had to have a paper, and he gave me a paper allowing me to return to my flat. That was getting Golden Hayes home. That was getting her back to, uh, back to France, to her home where I am now, um, in lockdown, only allowed out carrying an attestation and obeying all the rules. My library of digital sailing books is at gentlesailing.com, so you can buy them as instant downloads. There's a link to a printer who can convert them to hard copy if that's what you prefer. I've just totally updated and republished French Canal Routes to the Mediterranean, which is now in its 12th edition and is fully up to date with new information, charts and pictures. Recently I published Your Boat in the Sun, which proved an instant popular success. It's about where to keep your boat in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and the costs and the logistics involved. I sold 50 copies on the very first day. The Atlantic Crossing Guide has become a bestseller and it outsells most of the others, probably because it's arguably one of the most comprehensive guides to sailing to the Caribbean that's available. The Gentle Sailing Route to the Mediterranean is one of the most popular publications that I have. It describes how to coast hop all the way to Gibraltar without having to spend a night at sea. There are books about marinas in the Med, sailing in the Caribbean islands, as well as a book on simple navigation and even a Pacific Ocean crossing guide um, and a book about just living aboard a sailing boat. Anyway, it's all at gentlesailing.com so please do pay the site a visit and browse through my publications if you have a moment. Thanks. Fair winds.